Hey, what's up folks? This one's going to be about optimizing a website for mobile devices. And I've talked about this kind of thing before in, in different bits and pieces, but I thought I'd do a video with just all of it in one spot. And this was prompted by noticing that one of my most popular sites at my job, which is around, around 20,000 people a month, so it's not like make it rain popular. It's like popular for our kind of stuff. I noticed that in the last few months, it's gone over 50% mobile devices for the users. It's like 56% now. And for anything like a lot of folks, including me, uh, a, a not good amount of the time, your mobile testing is really something that's right before you launch and you pull it up in your phone and you go, you cringe and you just touch a few things so it's kind of usable and then you, you shove it out the door. It's starting to get to the point where your mobile customers, particularly for public facing stuff, is your main customer and that needs to be the thing you need to focus on the most. So this video, I'm going to take a just a sample site I made that I made purposely to not do very good with mobile devices and we're going to fix it up and look at the different kind of things you do to fix up a site to make it work good for mobile devices. Now this is just a sample site I threw together. It's for Bollocks County. Uh, which does not exist, I hope, if there really, really is one, uh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, but this is Bollocks County. Uh, it's got, you guessed it, the county seal on it. We have a little image carousel that, you know, front-facing sites seem to like these days. And we got some pictures of some citizens. We got one here that's very interested in our dental plan. We've got a couple others resolving a say a parcel boundary dispute through the traditional means of hand-to-hand -hand combat we've got another one that thinks it's a burrito so this is your perfectly normal everyday county government uh, got some text you got this snazzy looking map and sure this is not my finest work but hey i've seen uh some of your sharepoint sites let's not be the first to throw stones so this looks and works and functions terribly on a mobile device because I didn't do anything to make it make it easy for it to work there. And let's start fixing that. The first thing we're going to do is to make it actually look okay. So if I pull this up on a simulated phone screen, you see things have gone wrong here. Uh, that's overflowing a bit. We've got some... The text clearly didn't know to go to a single column. It's uh, things have gone wrong. So let's fix all that first. And I'm using Tailwind for this, but the concepts on how you fix this stuff will be the same. You might hear some things in the UX design world called responsive design and mobile first, and they sound complicated. They're really not. Responsive design just means your page responds to the size of the user's window. So if you set a div to a width of 100%, that div is responsive because it will resize to 100% of the window. That's all that really means. What mobile first means is the rules apply for mobile and you make exceptions for larger screens versus how you might have seen this in yesteryear where the rules were for larger screens and you made exceptions for smaller screens. So that's, that's all those things means. All that, all that means when you see that, when you're out scrolling around the UX world type stuff. Let's start with this header. Uh, this was two columns that got shrunk into one, which is no bueno. So it says grid calls two. Now by default, there's one grid column. So all I need to do to fix this is say, only apply that grid columns to, to medium sized screens and above. And this is a tailwind thing. So now we have this to one column, that's good. Uh, this this uh, image carousel is clearly too big. Let's fix that. Let's uh, carousel image, carousel width. Carousel has a fixed width of 800 pixels, which is too big for a phone. Let's just set that to a max width of 800 pixels. So that will resize this carousel down. Uh, 
still have a problem up here in our header. This government word, too big. Too big for this size. Let's fix that. Here's our government word set to text 7XL. Let's have it only do that for medium sized screens and above. Remember, this is a mobile first. Tailwind is mobile first. So when you set a size, it's that size, set like, like a text size. It's that size from the smallest all the way to the largest. And if you want to change it for screens, you change the larger screens and not the smaller screens. So go text, let's do 5XL. All right, and that'll fit nicely. And we've got our county seal. Normally I would do something to make this a little better too, but eh, this is just for a demo. That looks, fits nicely. This text should really go down to one column when you're in this size. So let's scroll down to that. Here's our text and we'll see, see it has this columns too. Again, columns one is a default. So we'll just say, a medium size or above, we'll go to columns two. Now that text to one column. Our map looks okay. Looks like we did a good job with it. And we have it. Another thing to be aware for mobile screens, you want to have some gutter space because people need to be able to scroll. Like if you're just looking at the whole map, you need to be able to scroll their screen and not accidentally touch the map. So you put a little bit of margin on your page you're probably doing that anyway, uh, so you're not running all the way against the edge of the window on a desktop browser, but just make sure you have that in a small browser, and we do. So now we've resized this to uh, look good-ish in a device. Great. Next step, you want to make your content as small as you can. Uh, Users on a 3G network don't want to load your two megabyte site. So let's fix that. We have some images here and we have some images in this uh, carousel, which I've not optimized. And we, this is an SVG image I've not optimized. And there are different ways you can optimize images. Uh, you can have image optimization part of your build tooling. I don't need to do that much image optimization. It usually is something that needs to happen once. So for SVGs, I use uh, SVG OMG from Jake Archibald of uh, Google fame and Squoosh for raster images. So all you need to do for that is we'll go grab our images and see this carousel of our, let me go back to squoosh. I'll just drag this over here. And we can change the format. And right now it's going from a JPEG to a JPEG. If all of your stuff will support WebP, you can see that and see how much smaller that makes it. We'll just stick with uh, Moz JPEG. And this slider on the right is the new image and on the left is the old image. You can do a lot of fiddling here just by say changing the quality. We're already shrinking this image down by 59%. We can set the quality down to say 40. Now I'm, I'm a little closer to this than you probably are. So I can see the tiniest hint of a difference, but not enough to really care about. So I can just do that and there's different things you can try reducing the color palette and and what have you. This is pretty good so you can just download it and save that to have it overwrite your your original image or overwrite maybe not your original image maybe you want to keep that somewhere safe but that's how you would shrink all this down. So we can take these images here that man up to 230 kilobytes and we can probably shrink them down to all together maybe 60 or 70 kilobytes. And that over a 3G connection is a huge, huge difference. Now for SVG, SVG is a different kind of thing, so you need a different kind of optimizer. But it's the same sort of idea. We'll just drag this over here. And we're going down by about 25%. We'll uh this is comparing on gzip. So we're going down to, let me, that's, we're actually going down by, uh, 
I think normally this starts out set something to like this. I've already fiddled with these controls. So you're going from like 149 kilobytes to 97 kilobytes. But you can fiddle around with the controls here and the precision, I can see a slight difference when I drop the precision all the way down to zero. You'll see like maybe a little whiskers will change a little bit. Uh, but not enough that I really care about. And now we're going from 149 kilobytes to 38. And this is the kind of thing you should do with all of your images in your site. Just reduce it to just above your pain threshold. And that, that's, that's less content over the wire. It makes for a faster experience for all of your users. You know, optimizing the images is something you need to do. And I'll put links in the show notes to these, these different tools I use. I just use these online tools because generally when I have the images kind of set, I'll just shrink them once and be done with it. Again, there are like image optim and some other things you can automate as part of your build step if you want to. I just prefer to do it this way. Now the next thing we need to work on is something that is a common, it's not even really a mistake, it's just not a best, best practice. Whenever you go to a site like, say, uh, Map Libre, it'll go quick start uh, and it'll give you this code to drop straight into the head of your web page. That's generally not the best way to do this stuff. I would probably only ever use that for, say, a Google font. And the reason is, is you're not getting any of the benefits of uh, tree shaking. So your build tool will probably look through and say, wait, well, this, this JavaScript library has 500 functions, but you're only calling three of them, so I can throw all that other stuff out. Or, and same thing for, with, if you're using something like Purge CSS with Tailwind, it's the same sort of thing. It can throw out a lot of that stuff and bundle it with your other code so you're not shipping so much. And it's also not having to, say, cache, make the handshake to another server, and it's... It's better to include that in your project. And I just put this up in Vite as a plain old JavaScript project. Let's go ahead and fix all this. We will take, uh, I have a little stash here because I didn't want to, uh, normally when I'm, I'm building this stuff, I do a lot of copying, copy and pasting anyway. So I don't want you to have to watch me painfully retype a lot of this stuff. But there's a, Vite has instruction or a, Tailwind has instructions on setting up Vite for Tailwind, but basically at the end of the day, it's gonna make a Tailwind config and a post CSS config. So we're just going to copy those over to our main folder here. And we can go into our styles and we will need to import in, actually, I will have to go look that up real quick. Vite, let's see. Vite, uh, nope. Actually, I probably want to go to Tailwind. I think that's where I saw the instructions. Vite. Uh, yeah, we want to put the Tailwind imports at the top of our CSS. And now we should be able to get rid of this tailwind include. Cross your fingers. Ooh. No, see if it needs to reload that. Yeah, because we messed with the post CSS file, we had to restart our development server. So now we're getting beat and it's going to purge that CSS and only use the stuff we want. The full Tailwind CSS library gzipped is like a lot, uh, several hundred kilobytes, and we're gonna end up with a lot less than that this way. We're gonna do the same thing for Map Libre, and I've already installed that locally on the, uh, in, in this repository. So we can just go import Map Libre dist, LibreGL.css to get our stylings and import GL from 
Believe Ray GL, and we'll change this to GL. And we should have our map down here still. And we can get rid of this stuff up here. So that's a best practice kind of thing to do. It's good to do that stuff for a quick demo or a quick start, but you want to not have that in your production site. It just makes things bigger and slower. And bigger and slower are what you fight against when you're optimizing for a mobile device. Now the next thing we can do is code splitting. Now the map library library is quite large. And you'll notice on the... Uh, on a mobile device, the map isn't even going to be visible first time you get there. You're going to have to scroll down and see it. So by default, when we import uh, map libre here, it's importing that library and bundling it with the main JavaScript. We can split that out so it makes it later after the page is loaded and the other JavaScript is run. That's called code splitting. And so we can take this GL out of here and we're just going to make an async function. And again, I did this at a time because this is another one of those things that I just copy and paste as I need. I don't really have this memorized. So now when the window is loaded, we'll have this async function that will say await import map libre. And this is telling Vite and other bundlers like pretty much all of them at this point that make this a separate chunk that it will load as needed. And confirm we didn't break anything. No, we're good. So now when we build, this is going to be a whole separate chunk and isn't going to slow anything else down. And it's going to make our waterfall happy and our lighthouse scores happy. Now another thing I would normally do for this, and this is another thing to think about, is use the intersection observer API. Because this is not on the page, a user may never scroll down to where they could see this map. With the intersection observer, you could say, uh, if this gets to where it's on the visible viewport, then go load that JavaScript library and draw the map and not do that before. That will save even more processing and bandwidth for the user. That's another tip you can do. We're not gonna do that here. So now we've got some code splitting. The next thing we'll probably want to do is make a service worker. A service worker is like a, it's kind of like a proxy that sits between your user's browser and your website, and it can do things like cache stuff for offline use, which will, it's not only good for offline use, it's also good for your performance, particularly on mobile. So it will load and if they've been to that page before and all this stuff is cached it won't need to go back to that server for most of that stuff so think of it like uh, a really custom high-powered way to do caching it can do a lot of other stuff too but that's that's a primary use for it so i'm going to take our public folder and when i'm developing i'll make an empty service worker which is actually a perfectly legal thing to have. It'll load it and treat it like a service worker that does, does nothing and won't cache anything. So I'll just have this in the public and this will get overwritten when we build our service worker. Now to load a service worker, and this is something I would normally have in a whole separate file, but since we're just kind of yellowing this stuff, I'll just copy this code over into our main JS. And it's saying if service worker is in Navigator, because not all browsers, all browsers you're probably going to want to support now have a service worker, but this is a best practice thing so your site doesn't simply explode. Um, it's going to, right here, it's going to pop up a console message if there's new content available and go ahead and fetch it. This is all really, really neat for a service worker. Now, the main work in the service worker, we're not going to build ourselves because ick. Let's go ahead and save that. Now, service workers and what we're going to talk about after service workers require HTTPS or TLS, secure, uh, a secure server. Um, but when you're testing a local host, it bypasses that just for testing convenience. So 
you know, it, it works high on locals when testing, but if you put this on an HTTP server, it's not actually going to work. It has to be HTTPS. Now we have a service worker, and the service worker is going to cache stuff if we give it something to cache. We're going to do that with a uh, workbox CLI, which is a Google node module. I, I've already installed it. So workbox CLI needs a configuration, and I'm just gonna, again, copy it and paste this over here. And it's pretty straightforward. You're just telling it, telling it to look in the dist folder, which is where our build is going to do. And for any of these global patterns, just cache that stuff. So that's going to be part of our package.json. We're going to have a post build step. And it looks a little like, a, actually it looks exactly <laughs> like this. So whenever you have something called post build uh, in your node scripts, it's going to run after a build. You can have a pre-build, it will run before build. So whenever I run build, it's gonna run this post build right after. Let me get out of the development server and it can go uh, npm run build. And you'll see after it's done, it's gonna run the workbox and off it goes. If we look in our disk folder, we'll see this service worker it now has all this stuff and it's giving it these URLs of different things to cache. And you'll see it split map Libre out into its own JavaScript include. And that's what that code splitting does. Otherwise that's all bundled into this index.js and it has to be uh, parsed and loaded when you may not want to slow down your whole page load for that. Okay, so that is the service worker. Unfortunately, there's nothing super pretty for me to show you with that other than the fact that we'll confirm it's working in just a minute. So the last thing you want to do is make a progressive web app. And a progressive web app, uh, it, it's basically an a couple different technologies put together. It needs a service worker. It also needs to be over HTTPS and it needs a manifest file and some other kind of best practice stuff. Manifest file looks like a, pull it up over here like this. And there's a lot of different things you can add to it. It's basically just JSON and it's got a start URL and the minimum two icons you need are uh, well, the minimum icon sizes you need are like these. And I just use an SVG for those. It does demand a PNG for one of, for the 512 by 512. So I put that up there, but it's look up manifest.json. I'll put a link to the description of what's all you can put in there. We're going to drop that in our public folder. That's just going to get copied over to our distribution. And then in our index.html, we'll just grab that sucker. And the syntax for, syntax for that looks like this. Let's download the other stuff. We will tell it to get that. I like to give them relative paths just to be safe. Get that manifest.json. So now when we run npm run build, it's going to process all that stuff. And now to give it a real lighthouse test, I'm going to run npm run preview. This won't run it in developer mode. It's just going to serve the content of that distribution folder that's all optimized and the stuff. So this is localhost 5000, which is going to look about the same. It should, should all still work about the same. We'll go to generate, let me just control F5, make sure it's not getting anything cached here. We'll generate report for mobile. And off Lighthouse goes. And you can see we are looking really good. There's a few things that'll ding us for. Uh, 
like serve images and next gen formats and uh, you know just whatever you're don't get obsessed with 100s like I do I do it wrong just uh, uh, greens are great I imagine this best practices is just probably because it doesn't like uh, the fact we're not going over HTTPS you can see in in the trace we're getting a page a user can see almost immediately which is what we want to see see we're, we're none, none of these contents are getting gzipped which is why these look so huge for this local server but the thing to notice here is uh, the regular script it runs is quite a bit smaller than the uh, uh, this other well, actually the script is a combination of both this other stuff is being cached that's the service worker so you, you kind of got to take that minus that to see what's actually coming across and I didn't really optimize those images and so forth you see we're we're super green which is where we want to be so that's the in a nutshell the basic steps I take to make something work really good on a mobile device it's a, a responsive design of mobile first most of your modern CSS frameworks are going to force you to do that anyway for, for the most part you gotta shrink those images down have code splitting for your big stuff so the page goes gets up there really quick and then the slow stuff can happen a little bit later don't use those quick start CDN things generally speaking um, and a service worker and uh, the manifest for your progressive web app so if we loaded this up on, on our phone right now our phone would go and it depends on the phone and, and whatnot uh, okay, do you want to inst this is installable do you want to install it as an app and you can go sure and it'll put an icon on your home screen and look and work a lot like a regular app which is awesome anyway i hope you found that helpful i will put some links to the different tools and stuff i used here and uh good luck and uh, make sure your stuff works great on phones because more and more of your customers or constituents or citizens or whatever they may happen to be are going to be using them i will catch you later bye bye